like a survey. Who has heard about cubes? Dealt with post-rush cubes? Not from Trade Gecko. <laughs> no one, OK, all right. So have you ever dealt with um, analytical processing? Like you're using your database not to build your like fast, small queries, but to actually build an analytical system or a tracking system of user behavior? Nope. All right, good. And that's going to be useful. <laughs> All right, so Postgres introduced, um, like, let me first explain what the, like, the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we have, you have a, like, a sales tracking system, right? And your customers want to know exactly how things are going compared like, to products, to locations, warehouses, to salespeople. And you want to be able to dissect your data in a way that you can, for example, say, get me all locations knowing that I have these salespeople between this period and this period, get me their total sales, for example. You want to traverse that in a way that is almost real time. The problem is, once your data grows big, you have no way to do this in real time in normal like scenarios. So cubes come into play. Basically, these structures will help you do this for big projects, for analytical projects. And you can basically use it in your company or your site projects when you want to build that. So well, unfortunately, it hasn't been discussed a lot in the Rails community. Yeah. Can you make it full screen? Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, it hasn't been discussed much uh, in the Rails community, but uh, it, is, it has been worked on uh, a lot lately, actually, uh, and discussed on Active Record and Arrow. So basically, the schedule for this talk would be a bit of introduction about Postgres cubes. We'll have like an interactive demo of how to build up cubes through a sales database. Uh, and then some discussions. I want to actually have you know, your opinions and your thoughts about architecture of how would you place this solution within your current project and how it has been it is being now adapted and used to like refine active record hopefully so basically from trade gecko perspective we came across a problem in our reporting system uh, customers who used to have you know like an average amount of data, we can handle the analytical processing pretty fast. As soon as the customer grows and becomes like you know one year, two years worth of heavy load of data, our system would come to a halt. We can like we either time out because we are restrained by Heroku's 30 seconds response time. We have problems with memory loading because Active Record loads a lot of data before doing the calculations, dissecting your data, and then coming up with like a concrete result. And so the solution was to actually start exploring how can we make this faster, and how can we actually get a result that is almost real time. <coughs> so Postgres, coincidentally, when we started considering this problem, Postgres 9.5 was in alpha version. And in Postgres 9.5, there was a very foundational difference in the way they started doing their internal structures. One of these changes was the introduction of three keywords that are SQL standard. Grouping sets, rollup, and cube. These three concepts are very much interconnected, and I'll show you how. But these concepts have been roaming around in the SQL community. When is Postgres going to implement those? They are like, like standard, they're important, and they open up a lot of business opportunities. And finally, one brave guy decided to take on that project and implement it throughout the whole database system. So actually, um, this, oh, what happened? Hmm? So this is basically the change, the commit, that changed basically everything about it. Postgres. Post 9.5, Postgres now can become a huge analytical database. Massive powers. 
Uh, and the guy is actually like, like there are, if, you, if you just look up his name, a lot of articles about him. What did you use before Postgres cubes? Different database? Basically. So there are other modified, like there are other like private companies that built on top of Postgres or MySQL. And they had like, there's like Percona server, which is a fork and a modification to include those capabilities. But now it's in the open source repository. And his work basically included everything. He worked on the query optimizer, the query planner, the syntax, the changes in the like back, back end, front end changes, because Postgres is a process based uh, engine. So like every query that you issue spawns a process, and it has to communicate with the front end to know when the execution is done, and when the data set is ready to be serialized. So he worked on various part of the system to deliver uh, that. And so like, if you see um, the implementation, um, it's quite massive uh, in terms of file changes. And that actually touches every part of the Postgres -like code base. Um, and the changes are, again, massive. <laughs> So basically, um, he explains in his commit the shortcomings of this implementation. It's a very you know, initial implementation. It gives you the power of cubes, but it has few you know, worries. You have to be careful around using them. I'll explain that later. Um, but basically, um, right, that will switch every time. I won't switch it. OK. So, so this new support for these three syntactic components, grouping sets, roll up, and cubes, uh, allowed for online analytical processing capabilities and multidimensional data analysis use cases, which are ba the, like the core components of a cube. I'll, I'll explain that in, in detail. Just, so, Let's start out with a very simple scenario. You have a very simple database, six records. You have a ID, a warehouse, warehouse one and warehouse two. And you have a supplier, one and two. And they have multiple transactions on those warehouses. And you ship your data, like your, your basically items to retailers, one and two, R1 and R2. And you have three items that you're basically just tracking. It's a very simple scenario, right? Um, let's look at. Let's actually create this database or this table. Um, ah. What? Right. What? Live coding. Hmm? Live coding. Ah. All right. So I created a temporary table. As soon as the session ends, the table will be auto-destroyed. Um, and basically, I'm going to insert those records that I just showed you before into the table. And here's our table. Right? This is the same data set that I have to deal with. Now, imagine somebody asks you, can you get me all um, all items, totals of items shipped but from warehouse one. How would the query look like? You'd basically do this. Right? Ah. That is not copying. Right. So basically, you just group by warehouse. You eliminate all other factors, and you get the sum of your items, and there you go. You just got warehouse one, warehouse two totals. If I ask that by supplier, you're basically going to do the same. You're just going to replace your dimension, or the group by, with supplier. That's cool. So this is very simple. This is what you'd usually do in a real-time application. Like This is a simple thing. If you have the right indexing, it won't take you much time. Now, things get a bit more complex if I ask you, you know, I want a one table that gets me 
suppliers and uh, warehouses totals in one query, your query is going to start looking ugly. And it will be something like this. So you're going to basically unionize. But because Postgres makes you have like follow the rule that if you're going to produce a query result, the union parts should have the same columns. So you're going to have something like null as supplier. You're going to add an empty column for part of the query and then do null as warehouse to the other part to make your table look like warehouse, supplier, item one, item A, item B, item C. That looks a bit more ugly and maybe annoying to actually maintain. What happened is they introduced grouping sets. So they said, we can actually get you the same result, but with less syntax. So instead of actually going to unionize and having to go through two indexes, if you have actually two indexes on your database, the union will force your query to go multiple times to get the data before joining it in memory and then putting it outside. Grouping set scans once, only one time. So now you've got 50% better performance just out of grouping set. Right? And it's the same exact result set. Now, let's go into a bit of like a more complex scenario. Roll up is one of the concepts that are usually um, used when you want to spread out a tree. So let's say I want to know for all warehouses, I want to get the total. And then I want to get warehouse by supplier, warehouse by retailer, and then get all the, all the contributing factors to the total. So basically, you're rolling up from one element all downwards. That's a roll up. So usually you use that when you're like, somebody asks you, get me all our supplies from person A, and show me the details of all the small transactions from that person. So you're basically having totals, and then one level of detail, second level of detail, until you reach the most granular level of totals. That's a roll up. That's the concept of a roll up. To achieve that, you had to do something like this. Now it's three unions. You had to do basically You had to go all the totals. So you have warehouse is null and supplier is null, meaning I'm totaling everything in the database from a warehouse point of view. And then you go based on warehouse 1, where warehouse 2 has a total. And then warehouse 2 has a contributing factor of supplier 2, supplier 1. So you have the details of each level. Now that is useful, but as you see, now I have three unions. I'm scanning three times. Worse, here we're talking only about two parts. I'm, I'm talking about two columns. That, those columns are called dimensions. Everything that is not in a summation that you cannot average or do an aggregation on is called dimension. And everything that you aggregate is called a fact. So item totals, item 1, item A, item B, item C, are facts of this roll up because they are changeable. Whereas your dimensions are things that you dissect by. So you're rolling up by warehouse 2. You're rolling up by warehouse 1. All the facts about them change based on the level of granularity that you're rolling up against. right? So that is usually common in warehousing applications and a lot of analytical applications that care about details. But as you see, it looks ugly. And imagine representing that in active record. It doesn't look pretty. So the solution is actually this. I get the same results. Better yet, I just have to mention what I'm rolling up against. But order matters. So the order of the dimensions decide the nesting levels. So you say, roll up by warehouse, then by supplier. If I roll up in the reverse order, I get the supplier level first, and then the warehousing level second. Now here, I had 60% cut of my scanning. I scanned once. I used to scan three times. Right, that's great. 
Now, let's go to a more complex scenario, a cube. So a cube is basically the permutation of all possible changes to your dimension. So if I'm doing dimensions warehouse supplier, what I'm going to get is totals, warehouse, total, warehouse supplier, supplier warehouse, supplier, basically. You're getting every possible dissection of your data. Imagine how many index scanning is this, like how, how much performance you have to actually sacrifice to get that result. So the query will look like, like this. Cool? So now, how many unions do I have here? I have four. For two dimensions, you will have four unions. For three dimensions, you will have nine. This is an exponential growth. Every time you add a dimension, this is three factorial, four factorial, five factorial. Every dimension you add is not a linear growth of your scanning. It's massive, massive hits to your database. So, but with a great one line, we get the same result. We just say cube, group by cube, warehouse supplier. It gets the same data but factorial less scans, whatever factorial is. So this is, these are the three new components that are introduced into the new engine that allow you to do massive improvements if you're trying to build up, for example, your sales dashboard. As a company, you probably are tracking your sales by country, you know, your subscription plans, your and you want to get that data fast, and you want your dashboards to be updated pretty fast. That's what you get for free, just by upgrading to 9.5. So that's nice. Let me show you now the look of the three dimensions. <laughs> this is a 50-line union to get by three levels by warehouse, supplier, retailer. <coughs> 50 lines to get 25 rows in my simple database. I'm going to get that with three lines, four lines, actually, because I use order by just for clarity. Ah. Done. Got the same result. So. 50 lines versus four. Same data. Less scans. Let's remember that. So basically, that's really what the new features of Postgres are about. As a company, you probably are thinking of how do you digest massive amount of customer data. Postgres presents it in a very simple manner. You don't have to learn much, because everything you add is in the group by. So instead of saying group by one dimension, two dimension, you say group by roll up, group by cube, group by grouping sets. You're just set telling the engine how to group by. And it will do that for you. So these are the three examples. And this is the last one with three dimensions. And this is the actual cube look. So actually, like, it, from, 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 po like from Trade Gecko perspective, that, this is the real motive. We did not want to maintain complex code that hits our indexes and database more times and gets the same result. Like That was very inefficient. So we wanted to get that boost. And so that's the purpose why we changed this. So as you see, very simple three concepts, <coughs> grouping set, troll up, cubes. Um, as you saw, I can represent them without 9.5. Like you can actually, in your current version of database, you can build a cube. You'll do more scans. You'll just waste more time. And so the, 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 the PR, the commits that were contributed actually just built on top of what already existed. The nice thing is the performance improvements and the better query plans that were you know, created. 
and less keys. So I want to now like discuss with you a bit about architectural stuff. How do you think this would fit into a bigger system? I mean, in a sense, if you're tracking data and dissecting it, and you're a company that has users, would you build a cube for each user? Would you build it per account? How, like, think about the problem that you would try to solve with this analytical capability. Would you build it per subscription, for example, to track all aspects of a subscription, all their clicks, all the changes per page? So you have like a, a page dimension, a, a click fact. Imagine the possibilities. How would that fit into a bigger system? Um, the problem is active record has a static resolution in a sense. It expects that every model maps to a table. That's the default. But if I'm building cubes per account or cubes per user, I might have the same description of the cube but I resolve it in real time based on the person who's querying it, based on the API that is being queried. Who's the user? What, what is the login? And based on it, I resolve dynamically to the correct cube to get the data out. Because remember, cubes are extensive. As you saw, like six records generated a 25 line cube. The problem with cubes is that they do all the possibilities. They try to calculate every possible grouping that you might ask for and pre-generate it. So if I've had a, like a, a million row table, its cube might be well like a billion. And actually, in our own data sets, we have some cubes that are beyond 50 gigabytes per cube. So like you're talking about a very simple Mathematics that you know you're taking, you're trying to optimize for speed, but you sacrifice space. That's a space-time trade-off. So, and cubes are not model really. Like in a sense, they're not model. They are a calculation. When you do group by, you basically expect to crunch some records to do some mathematical operation like summation or aggregation, and then you'd get the result. So a cube is actually a result of a calculation. It's not a, its own model. So how do you store that? If I have a cube that has a 25 or 50 gigabytes of data, every time you request that, I have to pre, like, regenerate the whole 25 gigabytes to get you your own query. That's not possible. So the problem also comes in when you think, how do I store this? How do I cache it? So of course, like database engines have other facilities to store, like materialized views, which you can refresh every once in a while. The cube will recalculate itself and recache the data and wait. And all your queries will hit a cache. So you won't have to actually do this every time the user requests it. Same goes for your pipeline. Sometimes your production data is dirty. It is not very coherent. It has some technical debt. And you need to clean up your data first before you reach a point where you're like, oh, OK, this is ready to actually be built as a cube. So your ETL pipeline, how do you extract and transform and load your data into a cube first? So that's also a concern. That you, like, the concept of cube is very nice, but once you start thinking about, ah. Oh, how does that look like in an actual production system? How does it map to all the abstractions? And as I said, the growth of the no number of records that you might end up with is huge. So how do I optimize? Like, imagine I have, a, like, as I said, 50 gigabytes SKU. How do I optimize it? Should I create indexes around it? Should I make sure that it's heavily indexed per dimension? Should I minimize dimensions? I shouldn't be very generous. The bare minimal that I can get, get away with, I should just build with that. That's it. And one other solution possible from the like, theoretical foundation of cubes, if you read like, about that multidimensional query processing, 
is that they build smaller cubes, and then they do a query across them. So, but the trade-off is a query across cubes is more complex. So you're, you're sacrificing complexity versus you know, speed. Again, it's, it's, never, it's, it's a never-ending thing. That's the, probably the most difficult challenge. You have active record migration, which is very nice. In a production system, you might end up with like finding a bug in your kube query. It's like, oh, that calculation should change. Or, I can't, or we can't multiply by this number. Or like, we can't do this equation. What do we do? I have a production system running, relying on a cube, and now I have to migrate it. I have to change it in real time. So how does that look like? You know, you, there are, I listed a few reasons to change a cube, but I, I bet you can come up with more. Like you have business rules bugs. You want to add and remove a fact. You like you tested out. You A/B tested the cube, and you're like, nobody's really interested in this type of totals. Maybe I should remove it. It's just more space. Or maybe you want to add a dimension. You know, your product manager comes in. is like, here's what I talked to a customer, and if we add this dimension, they will love us. They will buy for a year. Okay, that's more space, emigration, and you have to think about maintaining it. So how do you change your system in real time? There's no foundation that has, there's no discussion around how to migrate cubes. However, so as I said, these are some of the problems, like the architectural problems that you might have. Now, from a trade gecko perspective, we've actually had to build that migration system. We have in place a migration system that allows you to swap your cubes in real time. And we basically rebuild the cubes offline. So imagine you come in and you're like, OK, I want to rebuild the cube now. There's a, already a cube in operation. We basically rebuild the other cube under a different alias. And when everything is ready to be swapped, in one transaction, we swap the cubes. And we destroy the old one. But that is done manually. That code is written as a migration framework around the cube concept. It is not in active record. It's not in Rails. It had to be built. So the good news is that the adoption actually started. Errol now, the, like the, the, the query library that active record relies on to parse SQL and to actually generate queries, now includes the three keywords for Postgres. It already supports that you can actually build up cube queries if you're running natively to Arrow. Now, the challenge really is actually how to build the abstraction inside Active Record because that is going to be very different than your normal models. As I said, cubes are not really models. Their storage is different. They're not actually tables. And you've got a problem of Active Record migration. It's a completely different migration framework. And the resolution can be you know, a cube per user, a cube per customer, a cube per something. So it's not really one-to-one -one relation with your model. So that, these challenges are all present when you have like, to tackle the problem of building up and extending active record to make it include that. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Any questions? I avoided this project because I hate databases, so I don't know anything about this. Um, how long did the biggest query you had beforehand take compared to now? So and for some of our biggest accounts, a query that dissects by three or four dimensions would take up to 12 minutes with cubes. We can achieve that in under 30 seconds. So let me actually um, show a small demonstration of uh, our production account. This is my test account for um, the cubes. Basically, you can see pretty much that, oh, 
I hope the internet is connected well. Right. So here I'm doing like a very simple, like we are basically dissecting your sales orders by customer, right? So we are building based on your customer and their total sales. Of course, everything is fetched, so you have multiple facts in place. So you can have all these facts present, and you'll get all the data right away, right? So all these are facts of the same dimension. Now let's actually add dimensions. Let's start querying for more complex scenarios. So let's add a product dimension, you know, a location, a channel, and an assignee, a salesperson. There, you got it. That is a sizable cube of about seven gigabytes of data, right? That is a good, you know, customer um, data. Of course, you can go as, like this is for the last 30 days, I can actually dissect by a year. So that won't take much, right? The operational power that Cubes gives you is that it pre-generates the answers. It just pre-generates them. It just has to actually traverse your cube to get the answers out. It doesn't have to calculate them in real time. And of course, you can apply as many filters as you want. You can complicate your query in a way that you know, is limited by you know, total sales more than 3,000. Gets it. Right? Everything is faster when you are pre-computing things. But as I said, that has a lot of trade-offs around it. So you have to think carefully. In your own systems, how does that look like? Any other questions? The problem is, the problem is, cubes have like as a concept have been introduced lately into Postgres. I think the real problem is, and I think that will be resolved soon. Like as soon as developers start interacting with that concept more, you will find a lot of small extensions and libraries that come to solve this problem. The real issue is integrating it into your Rails code base. Like that is a big challenge because you have to incorporate that concept well in a, in a way that feels natural to advanced users, advanced developers, as much as like, you know, starters. Any other questions? Uh, am I right to uh, say that this is only meant for read-only transactions? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't really write to a cube, right? Well, you can't, well, actually, you can't really write a cube because you're storing a materialized view. And materialized views are not right. Like, you can't write to it. Uh, I'm sure you've done your research. Uh, I've, in the past, when I was dealing with large complex calculations, what I did is actually create a smaller table um, in front of it for um, for those summations. Correct, and then it's for the most queried um, queries. And then the queries that the user can do is actually limited to what is shown in this. So we know what kind of queries they're going to run anyway. That's great. So I mean. Did you guys do any analysis with you know deploying cube versus doing that traditional, you know? Yeah, I think the problem is what you were solving is a completely different problem than the one that we had to solve. Our problem was our users wanted flexibility. They want they didn't want to be limited how they traverse their data and how they look at their operations. So in a sense, I could like we couldn't as a team predict, you know ah. People are not going to ask for that, right? We had to do like we had we had to build up a structure that allows you to traverse. Like as you see, imagine yourself as a like a manager or like as a as an admin on this app, and you're like, okay, let me try this filter. Let me see this data. Let me see this summation. You're interacting with the system, and what you're expecting is a system to be responsive. So if a system limits you, you're like, okay, they're not providing me with what I want. I might as well leave. Right. Any other questions? Uh, how do you, which uh, architecture did you choose for the cubes? Is it by customer or is it by user? So actually, we are by account. We chose by account because we assumed that A, we are going to embed a lot of analytical widgets across the app that, as a user, you might not be interested in customer data, right? In like, like dimensions of customers. But if you go to your customer pages, you're going to see analytical data showing you statistics and understanding of how customers are behaving. 
So we couldn't actually limit it per user because that would you know, be like a, a lot of loaded data. Like if I, you and I are on the same account, then we probably have the same cube, yeah, right? And the other part is that we didn't want to restrict it by user because the really interesting thing is that we can embed a lot of information across the app in a way that makes this application you know, information rich, like more and more, more information. Two yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, did you end up writing, writing a lot of inline SQL? We have, well, actually, not an inline, but Active Record caused a lot of loading problems, a lot of data problems. So what we did is we actually like used vanilla SQL for cube building. And uh, data synchronization actually happens on Postgres level. It never reaches Ruby level. So we use uh, foreign data wrappers, which are extensions to Postgres that allow you to synchronize data Postgres to Postgres, peer to peer. So our analytical database basically uses the production database to clean up data and pull it up from that level, from database level. So our application level never pulls the data, does the cleaning, and then comes back. Like it's, uh, that's. You answered our last question as well. Does it hit the right time if you do inserts on normal data? Data does it recalculate the cube synchronously or? That's, OK. So that has been resolved by actually building at the correct time. Right. We, like, we did a small survey of when is the least amount of right hits yeah. come to our database. But it's not the, <coughs> not the service that Postgres provides. No, no, unfortunately. Unfortunately not. Right, thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. So, so um, either does the cube actually get synchronized to your different nodes? Like, in, yeah, I'm just asking. So actually, you can, you can build that. We didn't need to synchronize to a lot of nodes. Okay. But Postgres provides that ability if you wanted to. If you wanted to, you have you'd have to do a lot of like a bit more DevOps work, but we didn't reach that point. We didn't have to. Okay. And then it, it takes like you say, it takes this space, right? So uh, let's say if the table is 10 gig, then the, the cube is another 10 gig. So you actually need 20. Yes, probably. Okay. Any other questions? That was okay. How they get all the cubes combined? Well, we have around well. A bit more than a terabyte. A bit more than a terabyte. Any other questions? Is there a product requirement to show the data in real time and update in real time? Actually, that's the, that's a problem. Updating in real time is not efficient. So what we, when we build a cube, we build it per day. We wait until your sales per day finish up, and then we rebuild. Because you know, if you think about it, like if you have, I don't know, like two years worth of data, and then suddenly you're, you added one order or one sales operation. I'm not going to rebuild like a whole like 10 gigabytes data because to, I wanted to include one row. So the, like there's, a, there's, there's also effort on making the rebuild operation smarter in a way that it has its own metric. You can set up your own business rules around it to say, well, if you didn't reach this threshold and this update rate, then skip rebuilding the cube, wait until tomorrow or recheck your business rule again. So in a way that we, you don't want to actually consume, and as, as um, your name? Marcus. Uh, as Marcus said, actually, the, the real problem is hitting your operational database with reads. Like You're going to read a lot from it to build a cube. So it's, it's a trade-off. You have to think about it well. Any other questions? Um, OK, uh, sorry. So I'm going to stop the questions. Okay. And also, yeah, have more questions uh, for Mohammed after this, because uh, we have three more talks to go. <laughs> Uh, next up.